This video will cover the present recommendations for treatment and prevention. I want to point out that conditions are rapidly changing and the video on epidemiology of COVID-19 is already out of date. I will be updating sections of this video in the near future, so stay tuned. I recommend following the blog for our UF College of Medicine Fixing Healthcare Delivery alumni site in the link shown here. I will be sharing all updated YouTube links on this site. Also updates will be posted on Twitter at FS Southwick, LinkedIn, and Facebook. As discussed in the pathogenesis video, SARS-CoV-2 has a high affinity for the ACE2 receptors of airway epithelial cells and quickly spreads to the bronchi and alveoli where it causes inflammation and fluid accumulation causing a ground glass infiltrate of the lungs on CT scan and progressive hypoxia. Patients with mild and moderate disease can usually be closely monitored at home to reduce the spread of infection in the hospital. However, the clinical signs and symptoms may worsen as the virus spreads to the lower respiratory tract. Conditions that may be associated with worsening include older age, chronic health conditions, and an immunocompromised condition. Significant shortness of breath is a warning sign and may warrant hospitalization. If you suspect you have the virus, you should call your local COVID-19 hotline. Because each case will be different, decisions on triage are best managed by a health professional. The primary goal of supportive therapy is to maintain oxygenation to allow patient, the patient's immune system time to kill the virus. Nasal oxygen at four liters per minute is commonly required to maintain adequate arterial oxygen saturations above 92%. Higher flow oxygen may be required as well as non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, BiPAP. However, both of these treatments cause the virus to be released in an aerosol, fine particles that can be inhaled and invade the lungs of those caring for the patient. If oxygenation can't be maintained with nasal oxygen, experts recommend going directly to intubation and a mechanical respirator. This approach provides more reliable, positive end expiratory pressure PEEP and ventilation. If full-blown acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, develops, ICU care is warranted. Lung-protecting ventilation settings should be used and the patient should be periodically placed in a prone position. Septic shock accompanied by organ failure can develop and these patients should be managed using a standard sepsis protocol, including empiric antibiotics. Fluid management should be conservative, keeping in mind that these patients have fluid in their alveoli. In addition to high flow oxygen BiPAP, dangerous aerosolization can be associated with intubation, bronchoscopy, obtaining nasopharyngeal samples, and nebulizer respiratory treatments. It is important that everyone caring for the patient don personal protective equipment, PPE, a tight-fitting N95 mask or controlled air purifying respirator, respirator capper should be used during any of these procedures and always wear eye protection gowns and gloves. Practice properly removing masks, gowns, and gloves so you don't inadvertently contaminate yourself. You owe it to yourself and your colleagues not to break sterility and become infected. We can't afford to lose anyone on the front lines. Pharmacologic therapy is evolving. The one drug that has proven to be efficacious in other severe coronaviruses is the ribonucleotide analog remdesivir. This adenosine analog inserts into the growing RNA chain and causes premature termination, thereby preventing RNA replication and vir an increase in viral particles. The agent is given intravenously at 200 milligrams per day on day one and then 100 milligrams per day for an additional four to nine days. There are five sponsored phase three trials underway. However, the drug may be able to be obtained for compassionate use from the Gilead Pharmaceuticals at this email address. 
in anecdotal cases, hydroxychloroquine may have been of benefit. However, this drug was also touted as a treatment for other RNA viruses, HIV, Zika virus, and dengue fever. But in all these cases, it proved ineffective. A combination of hydroxychloroquine, 200 milligrams PO three times per day, combined with azithromycin, has been administered in China, but there remains no published, peer-reviewed, randomized clinical trials. Keep in mind, this drug can cause serious side effects, including permanent retinal damage leading to visual impairment, significant cardiac side effects, including cardiomyopathy and arrhythmias, psychiatric disorders, hypoglycemia, and muscle weakness. Anecdotal evidence also suggested that the antiretroviral drug combination, lopinavir and ritonavir, would be of benefit. However, in a controlled trial, the combination proved to be ineffective. A monoclonal antibody directed against cytokine IL-6 to zilizumab is also being evaluated for patients with sepsis and elevated IL-6 levels. Let me also comment on two other treatments. NSAIDs, ibuprofen, is commonly used to control fever, particularly in Europe. And French physicians have shared anecdotes that COVID-19 infected patients taking this medication demonstrate more rapid clinical deterioration. The WHO now recommends against NSAIDs pending further study and recommends acetaminophen as the preferred antipyretic or fever-lowering medication. Corticosteroids were used in SARS and rather than being a benefit, caused harm, and both the WHO and CDC recommend against using corticosteroids as a treatment for COVID-19. What about a vaccine? Time does not permit a full review of this topic, and I'm not an expert in vaccine development. The protein sequence of the S protein knobs is known, and this would be an ideal target for the vaccine. There are unknowns with regards to which segment of the protein to choose and issues with regards to what adjuvant, agent that enhances the immune response. And then field testing to prove it is effective must be undertaken. Experts estimate the minimum time frame for a vaccine to be released to the public is 18 months. As exemplified by the video on epidemiology of COVID-19 pandemic, the cornerstone for managing this disease is infection control, termed non-pharmacologic interventions. As outlined in the Imperial College COVID-19 response team's report of March 16, there are five tools designed to control the spread of infection. One, individual isolation. All infected individuals must avoid contact with others and wear masks and remain at a distance of over six feet. Two, voluntary quarantine. Individuals who have come in contact with someone who is infected should agree to avoid contact with others for 14 days. Three, social distancing of those over 70, year old, 70 years old, remaining uh, at home and avoiding any crowds. Four, social distancing of the entire population. And fifth, closing of schools, universities, and businesses. These tools can be used to implement one of two basic strategies. Suppression. All five tactics are applied to reduce person-to-person -person contact to the level that drops the R sub zero to below one. So the number of new cases progressively decreases and the epidemic is suppressed, but not eliminated. Mitigation applies tactics one, two, and four, isolation, quarantine, and social distancing of the entire population to reduce the R sub zero, but the value stays above one. In this approach, the epidemic continues to grow, but at a slower rate. Simulation studies reveal if the mitigation strategy is used, the number of individuals infected will rapidly exceed the capacity of the health systems. In this graph, the black line shows what happens if nothing is done. The peak exceeds the ICU bed capacity red line, 
by 30 times in the shown in the upper graph. And the number of people estimated to die in Great Britain would be 510,000 and the U.S. 2.2 million. If mitigation is applied, the orange line, the number of ICU beds required to manage patients would exceed capacity by 35%, best seen in the magnified lower panel. The Imperial College team recommends suppression employing isolation of infected individuals, social distancing of everyone, and school and university closing. Implementing this approach, the number of infected patients will never exceed the bed capacity and will minimize the number of deaths. The duration of the suppression strategy recommended is three months, and then upon discontinuation, watching closely and triggering if a specific number of ICU beds again fill with COVID-19 patients. This simulation shows what happens if the trigger is set at 100 ICU beds to reinitiate suppression. Discontinuation is allowed when ICU bed occupancy drops below 50. Over time, the area under the epidemic curve becomes smaller and smaller. Other approaches for monitoring are also possible. For example, an internet-connected electronic thermometer sends body temperatures to a smartphone and then to an internet site, allowing real-time regional monitoring of fever. A publication in Clinical Infectious Diseases in 2018 documented a very close correlation, correlation coefficient 0.95, between the number of doctor visits for influenza-like illness and the number of individuals with fever. This simple smartphone application would allow close monitoring of COVID-19. Let me end this presentation with several questions. Will our health system rise to the occasion? Our federal government has failed to anticipate the need for COVID-19 rapid testing, and outbreaks have taken hold in the Seattle area, New York City, and my, the Miami area. Governors are now taking action, and 40 states have implemented the suppression strategy, including New York, Florida, Illinois, California, and Washington State. Will implementation be effective? We will know in the next two weeks. Cases should peak in the U.S. on about April 3rd and then begin to drop. In a democracy, how can we achieve China's success? We all need to lead. Now that you understand the problem as healthcare professionals and concerned citizens, you must lead the charge and apply organizing methods to encourage everyone to faithfully follow the tactics required for suppression. We all can encourage social distancing, hand washing, and cleaning of surfaces. This is a campaign. Share personal stories of patients who are suffering from COVID-19. We each can share personal cases from the U.S., Europe, and the rest of the world. Find other like-minded champions. Write editorials, speak to your friends, and talk to our leaders. Hold virtual events to recruit others. We are all in this together. And remember, you can make a difference.